Hi, I'm Conan Matharson, and we'll be talking today in this webcast about antiarrhythmic drug therapy. This topic is often difficult for students because it's hard to link up the drug classifications with how we use these drugs clinically. So that's really the purpose of this whole learning exercise, to get you to a point where you could use these drugs in a clinical scenario. But first what I want to do is lay out the whole sort of concept map of electrophysiology and, and what you've been learning about over this past week. So you start out with ion channels, which is really understanding electrophysiology at a cellular level. Then you move on to kind of understanding how conduction occurs, which is understanding electrophysiology at the tissue level. Then you move on to understanding the normal rhythm. So how does the normal heartbeat occur, which is really at the organ level, physiology at the organ level. And an important manifestation of that uh, is how a normal electrocardiogram looks. Then the next thing you've learned about is sort of what's an abnormal rhythm. How does that rhythm go awry? And that's really pathophysiology at the organ level. And an important correlate of that is understanding what the abnormal symptoms, signs, and also electrocardiographic manifestations of these abnormal rhythms are. So where this lecture and uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy fits in, sort of down here, first you have to learn about the antiarrhythmic drugs, which is really pharmacology. But to really tie it all together and to, to make the whole thing sort of uh, one unit, what you need to be able to do is apply antiarrhythmic drugs uh, as therapy. There, there isn't really a point in learning about drugs for their own sake, uh, at least as a physician. Um, what you really want to do is be able to apply that to the abnormalities your patients will face. So that's the concept map of, of the learning activities for this past week. And this is sort of why I care about antiarrhythmic drug therapy, not, not only because it's important to, to know because you need to know this knowledge to take care of patients, but also it's sort of like a keystone concept. Uh, that is to say, it, it's, if you understand antiarrhythmic drug therapy, in order to do that, you have to understand all the other aspects of everything that you've learned about in electrophysiology. It kind of holds everything together. So in that sense, it's really challenging. Uh, but also it's really rewarding because once you uh, go through this, you'll really understand a lot about electrophysiology. So because the content of this lecture builds so strongly on the foundation that you've had before, I think it's really important that you have a good foundation. And so the first two components of the screencast are actually going to be review. So in the first screencast, we're going to recap the action potential and normal conduction. Uh, in the second screencast, we're going to talk about basic arrhythmia mechanisms and overview of tachyarrhythmias. In the third screencast, we're going to talk about treating arrhythmia mechanisms and indications for drug therapy. And finally, in the fourth and fifth screencasts, we're going to talk about the specific antiarrhythmic drugs and begin to think about how we can use them in clinical practice. So two points that I just want to mention before we begin, uh, which will help you understand the scope of this lecture and also understand um, how it fits in with understanding rhythm disturbances as a whole. And the first thing to know is that when we talk about arrhythmias, we broadly classify them into bradyarrhythmias, or slow heart rhythms, and tachyarrhythmias, or fast heart rhythms. But when we're talking about antiarrhythmic drug therapy, really what we're talking about is treating tachyarrhythmias, or fast heart rhythms, even though you might think that that term applies to treating both brady and tachyarrhythmias as a whole. So that helps us because we really can just cone in on uh, giving you a preview of tachyarrhythmias in order to help you understand the contents of this lecture. The second sort of uh, point of order is to understand that there are multiple modalities for antiarrhythmic therapy and drug therapy is really just a part of that. So shown here uh, in the corner is a power lifter using the Valsalva maneuver to enhance his core stability and squat at heavier weight. Uh, when a patient Valsalvas, you can increase vagus innervation, or rather, vagus nerve outflow. And the vagus nerve innervates the atrioventricular node and can suppress its function. So arrhythmias that are dependent on the AV node, which you'll learn about, uh, can sometimes be terminated by asking the patient to bear down and uh, valsalva. Shown here is a pacemaker. Pacemakers and ICDs, or defibrillators, can be implanted to monitor the heart rhythm and uh, pace the heart out of an abnormal heart rhythm, or in some cases, deliver an electrical shock to sort of press the reset button on the heart's electrical activity. 
depicted here is procedural therapy. So in the electrophysiology lab, uh, rhythm disturbances that are dependent on sort of a short circuit in the heart can be treated by using catheters to deliver electrical energy to basically burn those abnormal pathways away. But today what we'll be concerning ourselves with are drugs and how these are used in antiarrhythmic therapy. Here's an outline of the material that we'll be covering in these webcasts and how this fits in with what we'll be doing in class. First, we're going to recap the action potential. Uh, then we're going to move on to understanding how normal conduction in the heart occurs. Then we're going to talk about basic arrhythmia mechanisms, uh, basic mechanisms that can lead to tachyarrhythmias. And then we're going to overview some of the tachyarrhythmias so that you have a flavor of what these are like. And again, you're going to learn about these in much more detail in Dr. Kim's lectures. Uh, then we're going to talk about just some conceptual strategies for treating arrhythmia mechanisms. Then we'll follow that by looking at which rhythm disturbances are amenable for drug to drug therapy. And finally, we're going to follow up by going through some of the specifics of the different antiarrhythmic drugs and understanding how these are classified. And in class, what we'll be doing is really synthesizing all this knowledge from a clinical perspective. So here's just kind of a recap of what the goals are going to be of in-class learning. Uh, through looking at the clinical use of antiarrhythmic drugs, we're going to reinforce the understanding of the basic mechanisms, understand the use of these drugs, understand the side effects of these drugs, which are very important uh, in this topic, especially since these side effects tend to be uh, important and can also be kind of board favorites. And finally, we're going to understand uh, the arrhythmias themselves or, or solidify our understanding of them. So first, let's start with the action potential. And before we start with the action potential, we need to kind of remember uh, what the cellular iron concentrations are like in the body. Uh, so recall that sodium and calcium channel, excuse me, sodium and calcium concentrations are high extracellularly and potassium concentrations are high intracellularly. And depending on the conductance of the cell membrane to the various ions, the cell membrane takes on a different potential. So if the cell membrane is highly conductant to sodium and calcium, by convention, we say the membrane potential is positive or the cell is depolarized. And if the cell membrane is highly conductive to potassium, we say by convention that the cell membrane is negatively charged or polarized. There are two types of action potential that you need to know about in the heart. The first is the action potential that's seen in sort of a run-of-the-mill myocyte. So remember that uh, when the myocyte is sort of at rest, we call that phase four. Uh, the phase four action potential is relatively negatively charged. Sodium influx occurs leading to phase zero. So the cell becomes very conductant to sodium and the action potential now turns positive. Phase one isn't all that important, but there's kind of a little dip there. Phase two in myocytes is important because phase two is governed by calcium conductance. Uh, there's extracellular calcium, which stimulates uh, calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there's a high uh, calcium conductance in the cell membrane, which maintains the positive charge of the action potential, which is really important for sustaining contract contraction of the myocyte. Phase three is where the myocyte repolarizes, and repolarization is governed by increasing conductance to the potassium channels. And finally, the myocyte returns to rest again at phase four when the action potential is fully repolarized. So that's a myocyte action potential. The other major action potential you need to know about is what happens in a pacemaker. And a pacemaker type cell, such as found in the sinoatrial node or the atrioventricular node, has a phase four that is not sort of at rest and stable, but a phase four that slowly depolarizes on its own. And that's sometimes called the funny current, denoted as IF. And that is largely dependent on sodium channel uh, 
flux. So there are some sodium channels that are open, which lead the uh, pacemaker cells to slowly depolarize until it hits a threshold, a threshold where other uh, channels can open, mostly in a pacemaker type cell, calcium channels, which leads to a phase four, uh, excuse me, phase zero depolarization, largely governed by calcium uh, channel opening, and then followed by a phase three uh, governed by potassium channel opening for repolarization. So this is how sort of a, a pacemaker cell works, and it has automaticity. That is to say that it can fire on its own. It doesn't need an external input in order for it to reach threshold uh, by virtue of the fact that it has this funny current and phase four uh, depolarization that sort of occurs naturally. Another important thing to keep in mind is that uh, vagus nerve innervation will tend to slow down the phase four depolarization in uh, pacemaker cells and beta adrenergic stimulation will tend to speed up the phase four depolarization in pacemaker cells, leading to a faster uh, or a slower heart rate. So that's what we're going to talk about for the action potential. And now let's take a look at how normal conduction occurs in the heart. So here's a heart. And a couple of the important conduction um, tissues are shown here. So the SA node is shown sort of at the top of the right atrium. The AV node is at the junction between the atrium and the ventricles. And then we see the Purkinje fibers and uh, sort of the bundle branches. So the right bundle branch to the right ventricle and the left bundle branch to the left ventricle. So on the right, we're going to sort of plot out the EKG as these events unfold electrically. So the first thing that happens is that the sinus node fires, uh, shown in green here. And this is an electro, uh, th this is a silent event on the EKG. Uh, you can't see it because it's a small amount of tissue that's depolarizing. Although in the electrophysiology lab, if you were to have a catheter parked right next to the SA node, you would be able to detect that uh, electrical event. The next hap thing that happens is that the atria depolarizes. And the atria depolarize, forming a P wave on the EKG. After that, the atrioventricular node depolarizes. And the purpose of the AV node uh, is really to serve as a timing device so that the atria can squeeze, uh, or rather contract, and uh, really fill up the ventricles with blood. So you want a little timing delay so that that blood can get in the ventricles. And that's what the AV node does. And again, this is an electrically silent event on the surface EKG, although in the electrophysiology lab, a catheter next to the AV node can detect uh, the AV node firing. This leads to, on the EKG, the PR segment. Next thing that happens, the ventricle depolarizes, leading to a QRS complex on the EKG, which is, in the setting of a normal conduction, really quite narrow. And that's because the Purkinje fibers, uh, and the le rather the left or the left and right bundle branches, conduct the electrical impulse through specialized tissue very rapidly across the entire ventricle, leading to depolarization of the whole ventricle within about a uh, hundred milliseconds. An electrically silent event uh, then ensues. The the atrium repolarizes. You can't really see that on the EKG because it's probably buried somewhere in the QRS complex. But what you can see on the EKG is that the ventricle repolarizes, or the ventricles repolarize. And uh, that is seen as the T wave on the electrocardiogram. So we can see sort of the normal conduction. This is how uh, the conduction of the heart normally occurs. And this is how it builds up the electrocardiogram that's seen on the surface recording. This slide just shows the correspondence of the different um, tissues to the surface EKG. Now there's one other thing that you need to know about electrocardiograms before uh, you can, I think, fully understand tachyarrhythmias and also understand uh, drug therapy of tachyarrhythmias and understand how to recognize these rhythm disturbances on a basic level. I know that your electrocardiogram lectures are coming later. Um, but one thing that you should understand, and I think it's a critical concept, is to understand what the EKG looks like on um, 
in the setting of normal ventricular conduction versus abnormal ventricular conduction. And that's what we'll go through here. So the key thing to know is that in normal ventricular conduction, you get a narrow QRS complex, uh, nice and sharp because the ventricle depolarizes not quite simultaneously, but very quickly uh, because of the specialized uh, Purkinje fibers. Anything that leads to abnormal ventricular conduction, that is to say, the electrical impulse leading to depolarization does not occur uh, through the Purkinje fibers, for example, in the setting of left bundle branch block depicted here, leads to a wide QRS complex because the electrical impulse needs to be propagated from cell to cell uh, through slower, less specialized tissue. And you'll see in Dr. Kim's lectures that there are other um, reasons why you can have abnormal ventricular conduction, but the basic idea is that if you have uh, conduction that isn't happening through the Purkinje fibers, you're going to get a wide QRS complex. And you'll learn later how to recognize the different patterns, for example, left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block. Um, but we don't have to concern ourselves with that. Now just recognize that that would lead to a wide QRS complex. So that's the action potential and that's normal conduction. Uh, and we'll pause there for, for this video and the next video will start in with basic arrhythmia mechanisms.